All right, welcome back everybody to our final lesson in this series on hemodynamics. In this lesson, we are going to talk about the manipulation of our patient's hemodynamics in order to optimize the ideal treatment for them. Now in this lesson, we're going to talk about the different aspects of cardiac output and how they may be contributing to our patient's decreased hemodynamics, as well as some of the strategies to put in place for those particular uh, aspects of the cardiac output. In this lesson, though, we're not going to go into details and specifics about particular medications. There will be another future video that will cover the specifics of all the different drip medications that we use in ICU, and that will also include the specific medications that we talk about for optimizing our hemodynamics. But for the purpose of this lesson, we're just going to cover the basic principles so that you know what classes of medications, if you're looking at a medication intervention, that you would need to go to. And really the whole goal of our manipulation of our patient's hemodynamics is to be able to select the, the best treatment that's directed at that specific part of the cardiac output that is deficient. So this is going to consist of optimizing our heart rate, our contractility, our preload, and our afterload. At the end of this lesson, there will be one full screen that's going to be dedicated to the algorithm of treatment so that you can break down each part of the cardiac output components and the optimal treatment depending whether they are high or low, but we are going to talk about all those individually here as well. So the first one of these that we are going to talk about is the heart rate. So with your patient's heart rate, there really are three conditions in which we are going to manage in order to optimize their heart rate to improve our cardiac output. The first of these is going to be what we call non-compensatory tachycardia. And these are going to be our, our AFibs, a flutter. SVT, and our proximal atrial tachycardia. And so with all of these, we're going to have our, our first line treatment is going to be pharmacological. And so this is going to include our beta blockers, our calcium channel blockers, and everybody's favorite, adenosine. And so if any of these first-line pharmacological treatments are ineffective or your patient is unstable, then we're going to move into cardioversion. So the next situation in which we are going to optimize our patient's heart rate is going to be if they have ventricular tachycardia or VTAC. And this is important because we're going to want to treat this immediately. And once again, there's going to be two pathways to go. The first one is going to be if they are stable. If so, then we're going to look at lidocaine or amiodarone. But if your patient is either unresponsive to the medications or they are unstable, then once again, we're going to move to cardioversion. All right, so the final situation in which we are going to treat for our patients with their heart rate is going to be our bradycardias. And this one, pretty simply, we just want to increase their heart rate. So again, if we have a stable patient, then we will try things like atropine, dopamine, or epinephrine. But if your patient is either unresponsive to those or they're unstable, then we will move to either transcutaneous or transvenous pacing. And we will simply take over and control the heart rate for them. So all of this is pretty simple stuff, and honestly, it's probably stuff that you've already done for your patients many times before. 
All right, so moving on to our next parameter for hemodynamics that we will look to optimize, and that is going to be our contractility. And with our contractility, there's really two states that we will find ourselves in trying to optimize for the patient, and that is when their contractility is too high and when it is too low. And like we had talked about before with our contractility, if it becomes too high, it's causing an increased workload on the heart. So this is going to increase the myocardial oxygen demand, which can sometimes lead to angina and an MI. So it's definitely important that we do what we can to, especially in patients that are at risk, reduce the oxygen demand by reducing their contractility. And the ways that we would do this would be with our beta blockers, and once again, our calcium channel blockers. And that's it, pretty simple. So now in the case where our patient's contractility is too low, there's three different things that we're able to do to improve the contractility. The first of these is we can increase the stretch. And again, this is going to be our preload. So again, think about Frank Starling law and how that applies. Increase the stretch, increase contractility. Another thing we can do is increase strength. And the first way that we can do this is really just fix the problem. So whether it's hypoxia, hypercapnia, electrolyte imbalance, fix that and that will in turn improve your contractility. The other option is you can use a positive inotrope. So our first line to run with with these are usually our dibutamine or our milrinone. But also know that dopamine and epinephrine do have positive inotropic effects and they will also increase contractility. So if you find yourself in a situation where you have low SVR and low contractility, something like dopamine or epi might work to solve both your problems for you. And finally, the last thing that we can do for low contractility is to simply offer support. And this is going to be in the form of some sort of ventricular assist device. So whether it be uh, Impella, Bivad, whatever type of device is out there, uh, something to physically do the work of the heart. All right, so that covers everything with our high and low contractility. So let's go ahead and move on to our next factor, which is going to be our preload. So once again, with preload, we're going to find ourselves in two possible states. We're either going to have high preload or low preload. If your preload is high, your volume, your filling pressures are high, so you need to remove fluid. And this can be achieved through a few different ways. So obviously, you know, you have your diuretics. You can also do renal dose dopamine. And the thought process behind this is it increases the functional activity of the kidneys, which will remove the fluid. You can also manually remove it with dialysis or CRRT. And finally, you can sort of displace the fluid with venodilators. And the thought process behind this is if you expand the venous blood system, you create more room for that fluid to go to, thus decreasing the preload. Now, on the other end, if you have a patient that has low preload or low volume, then you simply need to replace the volume. And this we're going to want to do in a uh, like for like fashion. 
And what I mean by that is, wherever your fluid volume loss is coming from, replace it with a similar fluid. So if your patient is bleeding, you wanna give them blood. You can also use things like crystalloids. And with our crystalloids, we wanna be using ones that are gonna stay in the vasculature. So these are our normal saline, LR, our D5NS, all those that are gonna stay longer in the vasculature in order to help to increase our preload longer. But then you also can use colloids. And we already talked about one of them being blood, but this is also gonna be our FFP, albumin, Hespan. And these are really great, especially in patients that have lots of edema and lots of third spacing because the oncotic pressure of the colloid will actually pull that fluid from the third space into the vasculature, giving you extra volume above and beyond the volume that you infused for the patient. All right, so that sums up our manipulation of preload. And so now we're gonna move to our final one, which is gonna be afterload. And once again, you're gonna find two different scenarios for optimizing afterload, and I bet you'll never guess it, but it's gonna be high afterload and low afterload. So our high afterload is gonna be our greater than 1200 for our SVR. And so think about the heart, that pump is having to, to work hard against that resistance in order to eject the blood. So we can either treat that pharmacologically. These are gonna be things like nitro, nitride, the cardipine, anything that will lower your pressure, reduce the squeeze of that vasculature to expand those vessels out and to decrease your SVR, making it easier for the heart to pump against it. Also for patients, if they you know continue to have really high SVR or patients who are uh, post-MI uh, or have some sort of cardiac dysfunction, uh, we can look at doing mechanical intervention of the intra-aortic balloon pump. And the mechanism behind the balloon pump is there's a balloon that sits in the aorta that will inflate. And what will happen is right before cardiac contraction, that balloon will deflate. And what this does is it creates an almost vacuum-like situation. So it drastically reduces the SVR that the heart is then having to uh, contract against. And during diastole, that balloon will reinflate. And as we know during diastole, that this is when the coronary arteries are perfused. So it also aids, especially in patients who have had MIs, by helping to increase the flow or the coronary artery perfusion. All right, so finally for our low afterload, these are gonna be where we have an afterload that's less than uh, 800 for our SVR. And our intervention here is gonna be our vasopressors. And these are gonna be all the ones that you are familiar with being in the ICU. So this is gonna be your levofed your neosinephrine, your vasopressin, dopamine, epi, any of the medications that are gonna increase that vascular squeeze, increase your SVR, and be able to support a blood pressure, and more importantly, a optimal and sufficient mean arterial pressure. All right, so that covers everything on our optimization of afterload. And so the last thing that I wanna bring up for you is the algorithm of treatment when it comes to hemodynamics. So you can take a look here. Uh, I will leave this up as I conclude this lesson, but this basically just gives you a quick algorithm to look at and try and determine what's the component of your cardiac output that is deficient. And based on if that component is either high or low, what are the treatments for such? 
So as I said, this is going to conclude not only this lesson, but this series of lessons on our hemodynamic principles. I really hope that this provided much needed information for you in order to be able to improve your practice and improve the care that you're able to provide for your patients.